I want to begin by thanking all of you for being here. And I'd like to actually begin by asking all of you a question. What do you think when you hear the words world peace? When you hear the words world peace, what comes to mind? No war. No war. What else comes to mind when you hear world peace? Dove. Dove. What else? Having fun with a lot of different kinds of people. Oh, having fun with a lot of different kinds of people. Great answers. Any other? Justice. Any other thoughts? Economic equality. Great answers. Safety. Safety. Cooperation. Cooperation. Great answers. Now, what do you think most Americans think when they hear the words world peace? What do most Americans think when they hear the words world peace? They think beauty pageants, right? Beauty pageants. Have any of you seen the movie Miss Congeniality with Sandra Bullock? Well, there's a scene in the film where there's a beauty pageant. An interviewer asked the beauty pageant contestants what they want, and they all say, world peace, right? And world peace is supposed to be a joke, right? It's supposed to be naive and impossible, and it's a joke. So do you see the problem there? If you believe that world peace is naive, and it's impossible, and it's a joke, how can you ever move in that direction? If you believe that world peace is naive and impossible and a joke, then war becomes inevitable. And if war is inevitable, then why not be the best at it? If world peace is naive and world peace is a joke, and war is inevitable, then you have two options. You can be the conqueror, or you can be the conquered, right? But if we talk about whether world peace is possible, then maybe new possibilities could arise. So I can tell you what I thought about world peace when I was growing up, because I didn't grow up in the peace movement. So for a long time, I thought that world peace was a naive dream. My father served in the army for 30 years, and he fought in the Korean and Vietnam wars. My mother lived in Japan during World War II, and she lived in Korea during the Korean War. I graduated from West Point. I've served in the Army for seven years. I was deployed to Baghdad, and I left the Army just two years ago as a captain. So I grew up very skeptical of this whole peace thing, very skeptical, thinking it was naive and impossible. But what if I told you that I learned at West Point and in the Army that world peace is possible? Furthermore, a simple question can help us understand whether world peace is possible or whether world peace is naive dream. And that question is, are human beings naturally violent? Are naturally peaceful. If human beings are naturally violent and war is something they were supposed to do, then it would be naive to assume that world peace could ever happen. But if human beings are naturally peaceful and we have to be trained and conditioned to become violent, then world peace just might be possible. World peace just might have a chance. So please raise your hand if you think human beings are naturally violent. Only a couple people, very optimistic group. Raise your hand if you think human beings are naturally peaceful. Okay. Please raise your hand if you think human beings are naturally violent and naturally peaceful. Okay. Most hands go up on that one, typically. And we'll talk about that. But it's actually very counterintuitive. It's a very counterintuitive idea. And I'll give you a couple other examples of very counterintuitive ideas. Let's say you, let's say you were to go back 2,000 years and try to convince someone 2,000 years ago that the Earth goes around the sun. Would that be an easy or hard thing to do 2,000 years ago to convince somebody that the Earth goes around the sun? Would that be easy or hard? It'd be very hard. Because if the Earth goes around the sun, why don't we feel a sense of motion? Why don't we feel movement, right? And you can't tell people back then it's like being on a plane or on a train because there are no planes or trains, right? And if you're on a horse or if you're on a boat, it's bumpy. So why don't we feel motion? Why does it feel like everything is still? And when you look out at the sky, why does it look like everything is going around you? If you look up, everything's moving around me. I'm not moving around anything else. And here's another counterintuitive idea. If you were to go back 2,000 years ago and try to convince people that the Earth is round, would that be an easy or hard thing to do? It'd be a very hard thing to do. Because if the Earth is round, if the Earth is like a ball and the Earth is round, why don't the people on the bottom of the Earth fall off? Why don't the people on the sides slide off, right? If the Earth is round, why, when I walk for miles and miles and miles, why does it seem flat? So these are very counterintuitive. And another counterintuitive idea is we're not naturally violent. But if we're not naturally violent, why is there so much war? Why is there genocide? Why is there murder? Right? And another counterintuitive idea, there was a qu question earlier during the panel. Somebody said that 68% of Americans support war, right? But we actually have to look a layer, a layer deeper than that question. When you hear a statistic like 68% of Americans support war, what that is really saying is 68% of Americans think that war makes them safe and protects their family, right? 
That's why you can't talk about the military budget with most people, because in their mind, war protects my family, and war protects my freedom, and war protects my way of life, and war protects my children. And war has become synonymous with security, right? And the reality, especially in the 21st century, is that war actually makes us less safe. Not only does not war not make us safe, war makes us less safe. Now, if you convince people of the reality that war not only doesn't make us safe, but makes us less safe, now how many percent of people are going to actually support war? If you can go through that illusion, right? And it's actually very counterintuitive, because you think that the more you project military force, the safer you are. But the more you project military force, the less safe you are. It's counterintuitive the way the Chinese finger trap is counterintuitive. The more you pull, the more stuck your fingers get. You think that if you pull hard, you'll get loose, but the more you pull, the more stuck you get. So we'll talk about all this. And I want to talk about it by asking all of you a question. What is the greatest problem of every army in world history? Every army in world history, no matter what time period or culture, has a single greatest problem. Can any of you guess what that problem is? Every army's greatest problem. Getting people to kill. Each Getting people to kill. Great answer. And that is a big problem. Keep in mind, armies have lots of problems. Food, supply, logistics, recruiting. The problem I'm talking about is even bigger than the opposing army. Because if you don't solve this problem, you won't have a chance to fight the army on the other side. And getting soldiers to kill is a big problem, but there's an even bigger problem than that. Anybody want to guess? Disease, disease and sickness that people get. People. Oh, great answer. Disease, sickness, especially in ancient war. Very big problem, especially in ancient warfare. Any other thoughts? Yes? Oh, that, that, there you go. Right there. So the greatest problem of every army in world history isn't getting soldiers to kill, although that is a very big problem. It's getting soldiers to die. People don't want to die. People don't want to die a violent, horrible, painful death. People don't want to get stabbed. People don't want to get shot. People don't want to get blown up, right? If you look at combat, in combat, our flight response is far more powerful than our fight response. Most people's natural reaction, when you try to stab them with a sword or shoot them with a rifle, most people's natural reaction is to run away as fast as they can, as far as they can. Ask anyone who's been in combat and they will tell you it's terrifying. And General Patton said, anyone who says they're not afraid in combat is a liar. So people don't want to get stabbed or shot or blown up, right? If I go out, if I go out into the street and pull a shotgun on somebody or pull a knife on somebody, their instinct is to run from me, not to fight me. Most people. So how did armies throughout history learn to make soldiers fight and not retreat? Everything in your body says, don't get stabbed, don't get shot, don't die. Don't get injured. How did armies throughout history learn to make soldiers fight and not retreat? Sense of camaraderie. There's many techniques the armies can use. But the single most effective technique, here's a way to make this very apparent. What would all of you die for? What would all of you die for? Raise your hand if you would risk your life to protect your family. Every hand goes up, right? Do you ever wonder why the army has the whole band of brothers and the camaraderie and the brotherhood? It's so that people won't retreat off the battlefield. And I think Lao Tzu, a Chinese philosopher, said it best when he said, by being loving, we are capable of being brave. The Greeks realized that if soldiers believe they're fighting to protect their friends, their family, and their loved ones, they will not only fight, but they will even sacrifice their lives. Because our instinct to protect our loved ones is far more powerful than our instinct for self-preservation. Think about how you would react if you saw your loved ones being attacked. Think about how you would rush to their aid and try to protect them. So I heard a story a few years ago on the radio that kind of illustrates this. Okay? And it was a story about an 80-year-old woman. And the 80-year-old woman was walking down the street, and there was a loose pit bull running toward her. So what would you do if you were walking down the sidewalk and there was a loose pit bull running toward you? What would you do? You'd want to run, right? Your instinct isn't to fight the pit bull. That's madness, fighting a pit bull. What if there's a tree right next to you? Climb a tree, right? What if there's a house right next to you? What would you do? Go in a house, right? The instinct to flee from a pit bull is more powerful than your instinct to fight a pit bull. But this story was about an 80-year-old woman, and she was walking her little poodle. And the pit bull ran up and clamped its jaws in her poodle, and the 80-year-old woman bent down and bit the pit bull on the neck until the pit bull let go. 
But doesn't that behavior make sense? Think about it. Think about how the dynamic changes. If the pit bull is coming toward you, your instinct is to flee. Self-preservation. But imagine a pit bull attacking your child, your son, your daughter, your granddaughter, your grandson, your brother, your sister, your parent, your best friend. Think about that situation. The dynamic completely changes. You lose concern for personal safety. And you would grab a rock or grab a stick and go hit the pit bull over the head. Even with no military training. If you see your loved one being attacked by a pit bull, the dynamic changes where you lose regard for personal safety, you go berserk, and you go and try to help your loved one, even at great risk to yourself. So armies require camaraderie and brotherhood in order to function. At West Point, I learned a famous passage from Shakespeare's Henry V, which reads, We few, we happy few, we band the brothers, for he today that sheds his blood with me shall be my brother. West Point also taught me to treat my military unit like my family, and your military unit becomes your family. You live with these people. And army training puts you in situations where you have to trust them with your life, where you have to sacrifice for each other, and where you can't get anything done without teamwork and cooperation. And that builds very strong bonds between people. So the army takes people from every background, every religious background, black people, white people, Hispanic people, and puts them together and trains them to be a family with this strong brotherhood. And they put them in a situation where people are trying to kill their family. And then people have to fight to protect their comrades and their family. And that's what effective military units do. They transform soldiers into brothers and into family. Have any of you seen the movie Forrest Gump? Why did Forrest Gump risk his life to save Bubba? Why did Forrest Gump risk his life to save Bubba? They were best friends, right? They were best friends. So armies make soldiers love each other, and then they will die for each other. So do you see how that bond is very effective? So lo love of comrades is one psychological technique that the Greeks used to make soldiers fight and not retreat. Another psychological technique that the Greeks used was love of country. Love of country. Have any of you heard of the Battle of Thermopylae? Raise your hand if you've heard of the Battle of Thermopylae. OK. Raise your hand if you've heard of the movie 300. Okay. When I ask students that question, everyone's heard of 300. The same battle, but 300 is not that realistic. But during the Persian War, the decisive battle was not the Battle of Thermopylae, where the Spartans were defending a pass against the Persians. The decisive battle was the Battle of Salamis, where the Athenian general Themistocles had to defeat a very large Persian navy with a very small Greek navy. So imagine how frightening it is to have one person trying to kill you. Now imagine being outnumbered 3 to 1, 4 to 1, 5 to 1. So the Athenians were greatly outnumbered. And to inspire the Kurds that made their victory possible, the Athenians shouted the following battle cry. Advance ye sons of Greece. From oppression, save your wives, save your children, save your country. This day, the common cause of all demands your valor. Most people will die to protect their loved ones. I think many of you would die to protect your loved ones. So when the Athenians heard that, advance ye sons of Greece. From oppression, save your wives, save your children, save your country. This day, the common cause of all demands your valor. They were ready to fight to the death. And I think that battle cry has been used by every government since then. Not word for word, but the essence of that battle cry. Because whenever a government wants to make a population go to war, they have to say that we're fighting to protect our freedom, or we're fighting to protect our way of life, or we're fighting to protect our friends, our family, and our loved ones. How many wars have there been in human history? How many wars have there been in human history? Too many to count, right? Maybe thousands. But do you know in all of world history, all of military history, there has never been a single war where a national leader told his people they're fighting for money or gold or oil? <laughs> Every war in history is about what? Two things, self-defense and liberating people. Even Hitler claimed self-defense, right? But if we were naturally violent, why couldn't the national leader just say, look, you all are naturally violent. I'm going to pay you to go kill people who are just like you. Nobody would fight. So imagine you're a poor Roman farmer. Imagine you're a poor Roman farmer. And the Roman emperor says to you, he says, look, I want you to go to war. And the worst case scenario for you is you die, and your wife becomes a widow, and your children become orphans. And the best case scenario for you is you come back to your farm. He's going to say, are you crazy? Why am I, why am I going to go do that? But what if the Roman emperor tells a farmer, look, if you don't go to war, these evil people in this faraway land, they're going to come kill your family and take away your farm 
and take away your freedom and take away your way of life. Then he's going to fight ferociously to protect his country, his people, his family, his way of life. But think about that. If human beings are naturally violent, why would the greatest problem of every army in world history be when a battle begins, how do you stop soldiers from running away? And why would governments have to manipulate our love in order to make us go to war? So another question, another question. What does war do to the human mind? What does prolonged exposure to war do to the human brain? What does war do to the human mind? Makes it numb. Makes it numb? What else? What else does war do to the human mind? Traumatizes it. Traumatizes the brain, right? Have all of you heard the saying, war is hell? Even the people who support war will say that war is hell. War is one of the most traumatizing things a human being can go through. War drives people insane. So if human, if human beings are naturally violent, why would war traumatize so many people? If human beings are naturally violent, why would war drive so many people insane? There was a study done by Swank and Marchand. They were two medical doctors in World War II. One was at D-Day. And they did a study right after World War II that found that after 60 days of sustained day and night combat, 98% of soldiers become psychiatric casualties. After 60 days of sustained day and night combat, 98% of soldiers suffer psychiatric trauma. And keep in mind that 60 days of sustained day and night combat is a 20th century phenomenon. Because prior to World War I, soldiers typically took the nights off. I mean, how long was the Battle of Gettysburg? A few days, right? And prior to World War I, a battle might last one, two, three, four, five days. But in World War I and onward, you had situations where soldiers were trapped in combat, trapped in combat, couldn't get out for long periods of time, day and night, bombardment, attack, threat of death, constant. And they found that after 60 days of sustained day and night combat, 98% of soldiers became psychiatric casualties. But 2% of soldiers could be exposed to war for long periods of time and kill and kill and kill and never go insane. So why is that 2% different? Why can 2% of soldiers be exposed to war for long periods of time and never go insane? And why can the other 98% not do that? What's different about that 2%? The reason why 2% of soldiers are never driven insane by war is because they were already insane before they went to war. <laughs> In the, study, in the study, they found that that 2% is composed primarily of aggressive psychopaths. Aggressive psychopaths. They're having a good time. But fortunately for us, they're the 2%, not the 98%. But if we're naturally violent, we would go to war and our mental health would steadily improve. You go to war and the longer you're in war, the more your mental health improves. And if you're away from war for too long, then you start going insane. If we were naturally violent, if that was such a yearning desire of human nature to kill other human beings. And think about the military. Think about why the military rotates people in and out of combat. They do a year deployed, they come back, go back, back and forth. Because the army found that if you leave people there year after year after year, their minds start to fall apart. That's why we don't leave people there indefinitely. That's why we have combat rotations. And we let people go back on leave during the combat tour to compensate for that. And there's a really good book called On Combat, written by Lieutenant Colonel Dave Grossman. Lieutenant Colonel Dave Grossman trains FBI, Special Forces, Marines, Army, Police, every branch of service, and civilian law enforcement. And he says in On Combat, he says the first thing you have to know about combat, the first thing you have to know about combat is that combat is an environment that is toxic to the human brain. Combat is an environment that is toxic to the human brain, and you have to train people to function in combat. You have to train people. That's why you have military training. That's why you have police training. That's why you have martial arts training. You have to train the mind to function in that very severe, frightening life and death situation where the mind can function somewhat reasonably. So another question. During World War II, what percent of soldiers in combat who had a chance to shoot at the enemy actually fired their weapons at the enemy? During World War II, what percent of soldiers in combat who had a chance to shoot at the enemy, actually fired their weapons at the enemy. 50%? Any other guesses? It was about 20s? It was about 15%. About 15%. A lot lower than what most people think. 
Now, during the Vietnam War, what percent of soldiers in combat who had a chance to shoot at the enemy actually fired their weapons at the enemy? Was it higher, the same, lower? What do you think? You'd think it'd be lower, right? Because during World War II, we were fighting the Nazis, and Japan attacked us on their own soil. What did the Vietnamese ever do to us? Prior to the Vietnam War, most Americans had never heard of Vietnam. And the Vietnamese didn't look like us, but the Japanese did not either. But it was higher. How much higher do you think it was? How much higher? Anybody want to guess? 80. It was about 90%. About 90%. That's a drastic change in a short amount of time, right? During World War II, about 15% of soldiers in combat who had a chance to shoot at the enemy fired the weapons at the enemy. During the Korean War, it was about 55%. During the Vietnam War, it was about 90%. Today, it's nearly 100%. So what happened? What happened to cause that drastic change in such a short amount of time? How come it went from 15% to 90% in such a short amount of time, just a few decades. Training. 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 The training change, exactly. The key term is training. And what happened was the army got better at training people how to kill. The key term is training people how to kill. Killing is not nearly as easy as Hollywood makes us think. Most people have a very difficult time killing another human being, and armies must expend enormous effort in order to train people how to kill. And this problem goes back way before World War II. During the Civil War, soldiers spent 95% of their time loading their rifles and 5% of their time aiming and firing their rifles. So you would think that if thousands of rifles had been recovered from soldiers killed in combat during the Civil War, then most of them would not be loaded. But after the Battle of Gettysburg, they recovered about 27,000 rifles. 24,000 of the rifles, 90%, were loaded. 12,000 of the rifles had more than one bullet loaded in the barrel. 6,000 of the rifles had three to 10 bullets loaded in the barrel, and one of the rifles had 23 bullets loaded in the barrel. So do you see what was happening? Soldiers were loading their rifles over and over again, so it would look like they were doing something, but they weren't firing. So what is it about military training that people such effective killers? What is it about military training? There's many different training techniques the military uses, but which specific technique is so extremely effective? Dehumanizing. Dehumanizing? Anybody else want to? Guess? Behavioral training. Behavioral training? We'll talk about dehumanization next. The whole next topic is dehumanization. Behavioral training is very close. It's actually something called reflex training. Reflex training. Any of you ever heard of reflex training before? Reflex training. Repetition. So I'll explain to you how reflex training works. I'll explain how it actually works. Let's say I go out into the street and I try to punch some random person. And a person has no martial arts or boxing training at all. What are 99% of people going to do if you try to punch them in the face? They're going to flinch, right? They're going to close their eyes, flinch, protect their face. Close their eyes, flinch, protect their face. That's a natural reaction, your natural instinct, and it's a very smart reaction because your face is very vulnerable. Your eyes are very vulnerable. Flinch, close your eyes, protect your face. That is the natural reaction, right? Now, let's say that every day I hit a punching bag for three hours. Every day, I hit a punching bag for three hours. And I do that every day for a year. Every day, hit a punching bag for three hours, do that every day for a year. Now what will I do if someone tries to hit me? I'm not going to hit him back, I'm going to flinch. Because the punching bag doesn't hit me back. Right? The punching bag never tries to hit me back. I can hit a lot harder. I can punch a lot harder. But my reflex is still the old instinct, which is flinch, because the punching bag never hits me back. Now, rather than hitting a punching bag for three hours a day every day, what if every day for three hours I have a martial arts training partner and I have the martial arts training partner simulate punching me and every time he simulates punching me, I evade and I counterattack. He simulates punching me, I evade and I counterattack over and over again, three hours a day, every day for a year. And then we do sparring where we actually punch and kick, we have pads on, realistic training. Now what will I do if someone tries to hit me? Now I'm going to hit him back. I'm going to evade and counterattack because it, is, it has become a reflex. It has become a conditioned, automatic response. And here's a story that tells you how powerful the reflex training can actually be. Here's a story to tell you how powerful it actually is. In that book on combat, there's a story about two police officers. And one of the police officers, he wanted to train how to disarm a gunman. How do you disarm a gunman? 
So he would, have, he would have his training partner pull out a gun and he would disarm it, give it back to him. His training partner would pull out the gun again, disarm it, give it back to him. Training partner would pull out the gun again, over and over and over again, constant repetition. So finally they went to a convenience store one day and there was a robber at the convenience store and the robber pulled the gun on the police officer and without thinking, the police officer disarmed the gun, gave it right back to him. <laughs> without thinking. So the reflex training is so powerful. You can train people to do things that will get them killed. That's why the army has a saying, train like you fight, train like you fight. Because whatever you train people to do in that training situation, when you're in that severe life and death situation, your brain can't think. You're in a severe life and death situation, your brain can't think, and you're gonna go back to your training. So you, the reflex training is so powerful, you can train people to do things that will actually get them killed. But think about that. And if you think about World War II, for example, World War II, they were firing at round paper targets. Firing at round paper targets. But there's never been a war where people have been attacked by round paper targets. <laughs> so you look at the Vietnam War training. You have a target shaped like a human being, the target pops up, you shoot it, it goes down. Target shaped like a human being, pops up, you shoot it, it goes down. You do that over and over again, and now you have the reflex. You see an object shaped like a human being pop up in the distance, you shoot it. Just automatic response. And if you ever wonder why soldiers are killing civilians in the Middle East, in Afghanistan and Iraq, you have to look at their training. So look at police officer training. Police officer training, when you go to a pistol range, they teach you to distinguish between an armed combatant and an unarmed threat. So a target pops up, it's a guy with a shotgun, you shoot it. A woman pops up holding a baby, you don't shoot. Guy pops up holding a pistol, you shoot. Guy pops up, no weapons, you don't shoot. And to qualify, you have to be able to distinguish. But the Army is still using that old Vietnam training. And they're doing a police operation. And when you're in that severe life and death situation, you just go back to your training, you see something shaped remotely like a human being, you fire. And compare that with police officer training, you see a big difference. So another question. Have any of you read a book called On Combat, written by Lieutenant Colonel Dave Grossman? On, uh, pardon, On Killing. Same guy who wrote On Combat, On Killing, written by Lieutenant Colonel Dave Grossman. It's a, nobody here has read that book. That book should be required reading for peace studies. You can learn so much about peace from that book. It's a book all about killing. It's a book all about killing human beings. And it's one of the most uplifting books you will ever read because it shows that killing is a learned behavior. Lieutenant Colonel Dave Grossman was a West Point psychology professor and Army Ranger, and he wrote a book called On Killing, The Psychological Cost of Learning to Kill in War and Society. I'll, read, I'll say the subtitle one more time. The Psychological Cost of Learning to Kill in War and Society. He was, he, that book is required reading in classes at West Point, it's required reading at the FBI, FBI Academy, and it's on the Marine Corps Commandant's required reading list. On Killing is also required reading in peace studies programs at Berkeley and in Quaker and Mennonite colleges. So people in the military love this book. People in the peace movement love this book. It's a very important book and I highly recommend that you read it. But, on, but in On Killing, Lieutenant Colonel Dave Grossman says that in order to wage war, a country must portray the enemy in a certain way. And every country in history must do this and has done this with no exceptions. Can any of you guess what that way is? How must a country portray an opposing group of people in order to wage war against them? Less than human. You must dehumanize them, right? You must take away their humanity. How many wars have there been in human history again? Thousands? Too many to count? Do you know in all of world history, all of military history, there has never been a single war, not one war, that has not involved dehumanization? Out of all the wars, not one war where both sides saw that the other side is human. Right? And he says other animal species have a natural aversion to killing their own species as well. For example, a rattlesnake. A rattlesnake will bite every other animal with its lethal fangs. But when rattlesnakes fight each other, what do they do? They wrestle. They don't bite each other. When king cobra fight other animals, they bite them. And king cobra actually eat other snakes. But when king cobra fight king cobra, what do they do? They wrestle. They don't bite each other. Look at buffalo, look at bulls, look at animals with horns, deer. When they fight other animals, they try to gore the animal from the side. 
they try to attack the flank. They try to attack the flank or the abdomen. So, for example, an African buffalo, when it fights a lion, it'll try to attack the animal from the side. But when African buffalo fight each other, they fight head to head, the least lethal form of combat. If you look at hyena, leopards, lions, wolves, bears, most predators, when they fight other animal species, they tend to go for strangulation bites and abdominal bites. When they fight their own species, they tend not to go for strangulation and abdominal bites. If you want to kill an animal, you bite the abdomen or you bite the neck. But if you look at a dog or a wolf, when a dog or wolf shows submission, they roll over on their back and they show their belly. And the other animal instinctively knows not to attack it. Or if you look at two bears who are fighting, the way they know the fight has ended is one bear will turn his back. Signaling to the other bear, the fight's over, I give up. The other bear knows it is one, the fight stops. Now, why is that? Why do African buffalo attack lion by trying to gut the animal from the side? And why, when African buffalo fight each other, why do they fight head to head, the least lethal form of combat? Why is that? Preservation of the species, exactly. Preservation of the species. African buffalo spend 99% of their time around one animal. African buffalo. If they fought each other the way they fought lion, they'd all go extinct. And human beings spend most of their time around what animal? Human beings. So doesn't it make sense that we might have this natural aversion to killing our own species? Doesn't it make sense that we might have some sort of natural aversion? And that killing might be a learned behavior. But what evidence do we have? What evidence do we have? The evidence we have is all military history. All the military history supports this. Remember what I just said, every war in history has required dehumanization. If we didn't have a natural aversion to killing other human beings, why would every war in history require dehumanization? Why would national leaders tell people, look, these people are just like you, and you're going to go make widows and orphans out of people who are just like you? And this is done, this dehumanization process is done through what Lieutenant Colonel Dave Grossman calls distance. And he talks about three kinds of distance, three kinds of distance. The first form of distance is psychological distance. Psychological distance means betraying people as subhuman. And this is often done through a derogatory name calling. And in On Killing, Lieutenant Colonel Dave Grossman talks about how our own country has used derogatory name calling in war to betray people as subhuman. So what do we call the Germans when we fought them? Krauts, right? What do we call the Japanese when we fought them? Japs. And keep in mind there's multiple racial slurs for every ethnic group. I'm half Korean, a quarter white, and a quarter black. And I grew up in Alabama, so I've heard a lot of them. <laughs> and what do we call the Vietnamese when we fought them? Gooks, right? And what do we call people that were fighting in the Middle East now? What do you always hear in the media? What do you hear in the media? You hear the word terrorist, right? And the word terrorist has a racial connotation to it. Because when the guy killed those people in Norway, the media in America didn't call him a terrorist, right? He's a gunman. Or when the guy shot the congresswoman in America, he wasn't a terrorist, right? But if a Muslim shoots a bunch of people, he's a terrorist. If a Muslim's fighting in his own country against the US, he's a terrorist, or he's an insurgent, right? And this goes way back. This goes way back. What did the ancient Greeks call all non-Greeks? What did the ancient Greeks call all non-Greeks? Barbarians, exactly, barbarians. Any of you know where that word barbarian came from? The original origin of that, the, or, the origin of that term, barbarian. It was a way of making fun of how people talked. The Greeks believed that if you weren't speaking Greek, then when you talked, it sounded like you were saying bar, 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 bar. So they called those people barbarians. So making fun of how people talk and saying that they're making animal noises is a subtle way to dehumanize them. A more overt way can be seen during the Rwandan genocide. Have any of you seen the movie Hotel Rwanda? What do they call the people being massacred in Rwanda? Cockroaches. cockroaches. They call them cockroaches. So do you see how it's easier to kill people if you see them as barbarians, or terrorists, or cockroaches, or Japs, than if you see them as people who are like you or you're like your family? And what is the most infamous dehumanization word in history? The most infamous dehumanization word? What did they call my ancestors who were slaves? Nigger, right? You don't dehumanize people just to kill them. You also have to dehumanize people to oppress them and to exploit them and to enslave them. If you're going to enslave these people and oppress them and have segregation and lynch people, you have to view them as not like you, as subhuman. That's why the word nigger is so destructive and how it kept 
segregation and slavery and lynching going by allowing dehumanization to happen. So these words are very historically relevant and really important to think about. The second form of distance is moral distance. Moral distance means I'm good, you're evil, and God is on my side. And that is why civil wars are so bloody. Because during a civil war, you look like the people you're fighting, you have the same language, customs, and traditions as them. So moral distance is used to make people believe that if you kill the enemy, you're expelling evil from the world. So psychological distance convinces people that they're not killing human beings, but subhumans and cockroaches. And moral distance convinces people that they're not killing human beings, but monsters and evil. So you're killing evildoers, or monsters, or gangsters, right? You're fighting evil. That's moral distance. The third form of distance is mechanical distance. Mechanical distance means that it's easier to drop a bomb on someone at 10,000 feet than it is to shoot them with a rifle at 300 yards. It's easier to shoot somebody with a rifle at 300 yards than it is to stab them with a knife at close range. So the farther away you are from someone, the easier it is to kill them. So the farther away you are, the easier it is to kill them. Makes sense, right? It's easier to kill people if they look like ants at 10,000 feet than if they look like your brother or your sister or your parents or your children, right? And so here's a question. Why did the Nazis use a gas chamber? Why do you think the Nazis used a gas chamber? Why did the Nazis use a gas chamber? Distance, right. It was a form of mechanical distance. There's a myth out there that the Nazis used the gas chamber because it was efficient. But there's nothing more efficient than the firing squad. What's more efficient than lining people up, making them dig a ditch that will become their grave, making them stand in their grave, shooting them with inexpensive bullets, and throwing dirt on top of them? The Nazis killed nearly a million people with firing squads, primarily with firing squads. But they switched to the gas chamber because so many Nazi soldiers are becoming traumatized from killing women and children. So imagine you're a Nazi soldier. And for 10 hours a day, every day, you're killing women and children. A lot of people's minds can't handle it. You have that small percentage that can do it, that 2% that can do it. But the other majority has a hard time. And there's all these accounts of Nazi commanders petitioning Heinrich Himmler, telling him, we have to change the method of execution to protect the executioner. So it's all about protecting the executioner. When people are being executed, whether it's firing squad or hanging or electric chair, why are their faces almost always covered? Is it for their benefit? It's so that the people watching the execution and the executioner don't become traumatized. When gangsters execute people, when gangsters execute people, where do they almost always shoot them? Back of the head. Back of the head. Gangsters, hardened criminals, shoot people in the back of the head because they don't want to see someone's face when they die. It's really hard to kill someone when you look at their face. And there's been studies done about why kittens and puppies and babies are so cute. Think about a kitten or a puppy or a baby, or a baby chimpanzee. Why are they so cute? It's because they have disproportionately large eyes, and their forehead slopes back, and they have a receding jaw. Receding jaw, big eyes, sloping forehead. And there's something instinctual where you see that, and it looks innocent to you. You've got to protect it. And look at how people's faces transform when they become afraid. When they become afraid, their eyes get big, their jaw recedes, and their forehead slopes back. When you become afraid, your eyes get big, you raise your brow, and your jaw goes back. Mimicking that expression where people hopefully have some sort of compassionate response. That's why it's hard to kill people by looking at their face, because your face mimics that childlike innocence. Big eyes, receding forehead, jaw receding. In addition to the mechanical distance of the gas chamber, the Nazis also used psychological distance by calling people subhuman. And the Nazis also used moral distance by calling people evil. If the Nazis would have said all human beings are people like us, do you think the Holocaust would have ever happened? Of course not. A massacre as big as the Holocaust requires all three forms of dehumanization. Psychological, moral, mechanical distance. But think about that. If human beings are naturally violent, why would every country in history, without a single exception, have to dehumanize the enemy in order to wage war? Why would every country in history, without one exception, have to create distance in order to wage war? And why would it be so hard to hurt or kill somebody if you see that person as a human being? If you look at somebody and think, that person's like me, it's very hard to hurt or kill them. 
If you look at somebody and think that person has hopes and fears and dreams like I do, that person feels joy and pain like I do, if I kill that person, people will grieve, it's very hard for her to kill them. So I think the idea that we're not naturally violent, which all military history supports, is very uplifting because it's also the idea that at our core we're not so bad after all and that there is some hope for the human race. And where does dehumanization come from? Where does it come from? Where does dehumanization actually come from? Anybody want to guess? Here's a quote from George Orwell. George Orwell said, one of the most horrible features of war, one of the most horrible features of war is that all the hatred, all the lies, all the propaganda always comes from people who aren't fighting. <laughs> Civilians, politicians, people in the media. That's where dehumanization comes from. Look throughout history. And look especially today in the modern world. Right? Now, I'm not saying that people can't become violent. People can certainly become violent. One of the best documentaries about this is the documentary about Mike Tyson. Any of you seen that documentary about Mike Tyson? Every peace person should watch this documentary on Mike Tyson to see how people become violent through conditioning and bullying and abuse. And they talk about in the documentary, Mike Tyson discusses how when he was a small boy, he always got picked on and bullied. He said he was short, he was fat, he wore glasses, everybody picked on him. And he was so afraid of fighting. And the first altercation he ever had with another human being, these bullies took his glasses and put his glasses in the milk cart. He said he just ran. He was so afraid he just ran. And he talks about the very first time he got in the fight. The very first time he got in the fight, he used to raise these pigeons. And one day these bullies found his pigeons. And they took one of his pigeons. And Mike Tyson was a little kid and said, give me my bird back. And the bully broke the bird's neck and threw it at him. And Mike Tyson just went berserk and beat the bigger kid up. Look at the violent criminal population. The vast majority of people in the violent criminal population were abused growing up. If you beat a dog, the dog becomes vicious. And my father had a very violent temper. I was bullied growing up. And part of the reason I got into this whole peace thing is I have a very violent temper. And I was trying to learn how to control my own violent urges to act out. Trying to figure out how to control my own violent urges. But I wasn't born like that. I was conditioned to become violent. So many people ask me as a soldier, how did I become interested in peace? As a young child, I had witnessed how war had traumatized my father, and growing up living with him was very frightening due to his violent behavior. So when I was very young, I began thinking about the problem of war and why war has to end. But then many people asked me, if I wanted war to end, why did I join the army? Well, I think I joined the army for the same reason many people join the army. Because in our society, we're taught that we need war to end war and we need violence to stop violence. Think about Spider-Man or Superman or Batman. How did Spider-Man, Superman, and Batman save the world and protect humanity? What did they do? They punched people in the face, right? They beat people up. In the action movies I saw as a child, the hero would kill the bad guys, save the world, kiss the girl, and all would be well. So we're taught, if you want to stop war, you have to wage war. If you want to stop violence, you have to commit violence. You have to make the world more peaceful through violent methods. So most soldiers want peace, and here's some evidence. During World War II, when we were fighting the Nazis, and we were attacked by Japan, recruitment into the military is very high. During the Vietnam War, when soldiers weren't sure why they were fighting, it was much more difficult to get people into the military. And if you look at accounts of Vietnam veterans, many of them say they were fighting to protect their comrades and to bring their brothers home and the fight to protect the person to their left and to their right. But after September 11th, when we were attacked, an American politician said that we need to use military force to make the world safer and spread freedom and democracy around the globe. Again, recruitment went up. I mean, listen to President Obama or President Bush. The military is protecting freedom and democracy and making the world better for all and protecting the American homeland and helping the women in Afghanistan. When you have that kind of idealism, people want to join the military. This act of service, right? People say, I was in the service, helping others. So most soldiers want peace, but peace is the objective, not the means of arriving at that objective. So what happened in my life that caused me to see peace not just as the objective, but as the means of arriving at that objective? What was the transformational process that caused that to happen? Well, during my time at West Point and in the Army, I learned several things that changed my life, and I'll share a few of those things today. 
the first thing I learned that changed my life was West Point taught me that in the 21st century the nature of war is drastically changing. And it's changing in a way that many people don't realize. So how is the nature of war drastically changing in the 21st century? West Point taught me in the 21st century war is all about winning hearts and minds. And that term became very popular during the Vietnam War, but what does that mean to win hearts and minds? What it means is that you can no longer kill your way to victory. You can no longer kill your way to victory. So a thousand years ago, you kill enough people, you win the war. 500 years ago, you kill enough people, you win the war. But now you kill too many people and you lose. You kill civilians, for example. And now more people around the world want to fight you. So technology forces war to evolve. After the rifle was invented, swords were no longer used. After the machine gun was invented, people no longer fought lined up in rows. After the tank was invented and mass produced, the trenches from World War I went away. So what new technological innovation has forced war to evolve again? What new technological innovation has forced war to evolve more than the invention of the rifle or the machine gun or the tank? Nuclear arms. Nuclear arms. Keep in mind, nuclear arms, they haven't been used in war since World War II, and you can't really use them anymore without total annihilation. Drones. Drones. Keep in, drones, that's a good answer. Keep in mind that we have had airplanes for a while, even though these are unmanned. But this is even more dramatic. This change is bigger than the machine gun in terms of how it's created a paradigm shift in strategic operations. Paradigm shift. The computer, the internet, the camera, YouTube, Facebook, mass media, CNN, television, international newspapers. Mass media has dramatically changed warfare. If Abu Ghraib would have happened 500 years ago, would anybody know about it? Maybe some historian would have written two sentences or something. But now there's a situation like that where civilians are killed and there's pictures and there's video and it's all over the internet. It's all over the international news and people can see it. They can watch a YouTube video about civilians getting killed. So this has dramatically changed warfare. And West Point taught me that in the 21st century, Wars are fought on CNN, Fox News, Al Jazeera, and the internet as much as they are fought in the battlefield. And if you are seen as unjust, and images of your injustice are shown to people around the world, you will create new enemies around the world far faster than you can kill them. And if you do not win the hearts and minds of the people, you will strengthen their determination to fight you tenfold, a hundredfold, a thousandfold. So I was watching 60 Minutes, and a Marine colonel in Afghanistan said, if you kill a thousand Taliban and two civilians, it's a loss. Why did that Marine colonel in Afghanistan say, if you kill a thousand Taliban and two civilians, it's a loss? Why did he say that? What will happen if you kill two civilians? You'll create more, many more people who want to fight you, right? You'll turn the local population against you. And what would happen if the Afghan or Canadian or French or Chinese army came to America? and kill two American civilians. How would the Americans react? We would go berserk. People don't like it when you come to their country and kill their people. It's common sense, right? So this Marine colonel in Afghanistan said, if you kill a thousand Taliban and two civilians, it's a loss. In other words, if less than 1% of the casualties you inflict are civilians, you will lose. But here's the problem. From World War II until today, the majority of people killed in war are civilians. In some conflicts, up to 90% of the people killed are civilians. So do you see why war is becoming so obsolete? It's a method of conflict resolution where the majority of people you kill are civilians. Even if you try not to kill civilians, just the nature of war, the chaos of war, the confusion of war, the fog of war, you end up killing civilians. There were thousands of Vietnam, there were thousands of American soldiers in Vietnam who were killed by their own comrades, just from the confusion and chaos and fog of war. Friendly fire. So how do you win hearts and minds? How do you win hearts and minds? Well, the first thing you have to do is you have to admit the fact that people have hearts and minds, right? <laughs> so you can't dehumanize them. And I think we have to look at the masters of winning hearts and minds. We have to look at the masters of winning hearts and minds. Gandhi, Martin Luther King Jr., Susan B. Anthony, Nelson Mandela. Nelson Mandela won the hearts and minds of many of his prison guards. These people are masters of winning hearts and minds. And Gandhi was more tactically and strategically brilliant than any general I've ever studied. Gandhi was more tactically and strategically brilliant than Alexander the Great, Hannibal, or Napoleon. And think about it. 
Gandhi was able to defeat the most powerful empire on earth, the British Empire, without firing a single bullet. Even more impressive, Gandhi was able to transform his enemy into a friend. I think if Sun Tzu, who wrote The Art of War, would have been alive and able to witness Gandhi, he would have been in awe because Gandhi thought tactically and strategically. Gandhi had been a soldier in the army and had served in the Boran Zulu Wars, and Gandhi used militaristic language. He called his methods the most powerful weapon, and he called his supporters an army of peace. There's a good quote from Sun Tzu, who wrote The Art of War. He said, winning a hundred victories and a hundred battles is not the pinnacle of excellence. Defeating your opponent without bloodshed is the pinnacle of excellence. Second thing I learned that changed my life is this idea of waging peace. Waging peace. Waging peace. What does that term mean, waging peace? What does that mean, waging peace? What does it sound like? It's, an, it's active. It's active. It's not passive. It's active. It's an action. Peace is an action. Peace isn't being quiet. Peace isn't being alone in the room. It's not being in the beach. It's an action. It's a verb. Waging peace, it's an action. So what are examples of waging peace in history? What are examples throughout history of waging peace? Martin Luther King Jr., Civil Rights Movement, great example. What are other examples? Pardon? The women. The women, exactly. Alice Paul, Susan B. Anthony, Women's Rights Movement. What are other examples? Pardon? Germany. Reunification of Germany, exactly. There's many different examples. Howard Zinn said, between war and apathy, there are a thousand possibilities. A thousand things you can do between bombing people and doing nothing. Mother Teresa, Albert Schweitzer, Gandhi, women's rights movement, civil rights movement, Nelson Mandela, Archbishop Desmond Tutu. What all of you are doing, right? Many different ways to wage peace. Diplomacy can even be a form of waging peace. And our lives have been dramatically impacted by waging peace. Our lives have dramatically been impacted by especially that grassroots form of waging peace. Let's talk about a couple of misconceptions. What did our founding fathers talk about? What did our founding fathers talk about? No taxation without representation. What does that mean, no taxation without representation? What does that mean? Anybody remember from elementary school history? It means you can't tax me unless you give me a vote. You can't tell me what to do unless you give me some sort of participation in the democratic process. You can't tax me or control me unless you give me some sort of say. That's a reasonable grievance, right? But up until the 1820s and 1830s, 50 years after the Revolutionary War, less than 10% of the American population could vote. Women couldn't vote. African Americans couldn't vote. Native Americans couldn't vote. White people couldn't vote in most places unless they owned land. So 200 years ago in America, women couldn't vote their own property. Did the, did the women fight a war to get that right? Did they fight a war using violence as the means to get that right? They waged peace, right? They used nonviolent struggle, nonviolent struggle to get that right. Did the non-landowners fight a war to get the right to vote? Did people fight a war to get child labor laws? Did people fight a violent war to get workers' rights? How many, how many European countries had a war to free the slaves? How many European countries had a war to free the slaves? Zero. Zero. But look at America. The Civil War in America helped keep the Union together, but it took a peaceful movement during the Civil Rights era before African Americans truly got their human rights. The people in the North did not win hearts and minds in the South by attacking them and change attitudes about slavery and black people being equal. It took a peaceful movement, the Civil Rights Movement, to truly win hearts and minds in the South. So our lives have been dramatically impacted by waging peace. And it shows how distorted our history is, right? If you look at people who wage peace, Susan B. Anthony, Mark Twain, Woody Guthrie, Martin Luther King Jr., these people are as American as apple pie. It's a very proud part of our American heritage, a very patriotic act. If you look at Mark Twain, uh, Woody Guthrie, Susan B. Anthony, Martin Luther King Jr., uh, Frederick Douglass, right? Henry David Thoreau. So, another thing that I learned that changed my life, the third thing I learned that changed my life, and this might sound surprising, is that there are far more similarities between waging war and waging peace than differences. And many of the skills you need for waging war, you also need for waging peace. That might sound counterintuitive, but think about all the things you need for waging war that you also need for waging peace. 
Whether you're waging war or waging peace, you need training, organization, planning, recruiting. What else do you need for waging war and waging peace? What else do they have in common? Leadership. leadership. You need leadership for both. What else do they have in common? Strategy, mission, purpose. Whether you're waging war or waging peace, you need to win hearts and minds. We were trying to win hearts and minds in Vietnam. Martin Luther King Jr. was trying to win hearts and minds in America. Who did a better job than Martin Luther King Jr.? Whether you're waging war or waging peace, you need leadership, courage, discipline, selflessness, sacrifice, camaraderie, solidarity, teamwork, cooperation. You can see all of these things in the civil rights movement, and you can see all of these things in the military unit. But there are two crucial differences between waging war and waging peace. Two crucial differences. What's different about waging war and waging peace? What's different about the, both of them? Violence. Violence is the means, right. Violence is the means. When waging war, you're trying to transform a human being into a corpse. When waging peace, you're trying to transform a human being into a friend. That's a big difference, right? But there's another crucial difference between waging war and waging peace. There's another crucial difference. Fundamental difference. I think Sun Tzu, who wrote The Art of War, said it best when he said, all war is based on deception. When you're near, you want your enemy to think you're far. When you're far, you want your enemy to think you're near. When you're about to attack, you want your enemy to think you're unable to attack. When you're unable to attack, you want your enemy to think you're about to attack. When you're active, you want your enemy to think you're inactive. When you're inactive, you want your enemy to think you're active. A long time ago, I used to box, and I learned that boxing is based on deception. You want to hit your opponent with your left hand, but you want your opponent to think you're going to hit him with your right hand. You want to hit your opponent with a left hook, but you want your opponent to think you're going to hit him with a right uppercut. Waging peace, on the other hand, is based on the truth. It involves exposing the truth about women's equality, racial equality, oppression, injustice, slavery, war. Gandhi never had any secret plans. Gandhi never had a top secret file. When Gandhi would conduct a demonstration, he would tell everybody what he's going to do when he's going to do it. What did Gandhi do when he did his salt march to the sea? What did he do? He told the British, here's my plan. Here's what I'm going to do. Come arrest me if you want to. And later on in the question and answer session, if there's time for that, we can talk about very specific strategic reasons why that was so brilliant. So it's truth telling, right? Susan B. Anthony, Alice Paul saying, look, women are not intellectually inferior to men. If women are allowed to vote and own property, society will not collapse. African Americans are not subhuman. Africans are not born to be slaves. It's truth telling. War does not make us safe. Human beings aren't naturally violent. There's a better way to resolve conflict than through war. It's truth telling, not deception. So I consider myself pro-military and anti-war. And people have told me that doesn't make, that doesn't make any sense. But it's like being pro-fireman and anti-forest fire. For example, Martin Luther King Jr. was very anti-war. He was anti-Vietnam War and anti all war. And if you've heard me say this before, please don't give away the answer. Let people figure it out. People always get it eventually. But Martin Luther King Jr. was anti-Vietnam War and anti-all war. But did you know that one of the few television shows that Martin Luther King Jr. would let his children watch was a television show that glorified the military? A television show that he himself liked. A television show that portrays people in the military with exceptional noble qualities. Can any of you guess what the television show was? MASH is a good guess. MASH is a great guess. MASH, by the way, is the Dalai Lama's favorite television show. But the show I am talking about is the most famous television show ever made. More famous than Seinfeld, more famous than The Simpsons. When the Dalai Lama first came to America, all of his monks wanted to go see the set of this show. Here's a story to, you'll get it after I tell this story. So there was an actress in the show, a female actress, and she was at a party. And someone said to her, one of your fans wants to talk to you. And she turned around, and the fan was Martin Luther King Jr. And he goes, I just want to tell you how much I love your show. My kids love your show. I just want to commend you on such a great, uh, great television series. And she said, she said, actually, I'm going to lead the show after the season. And he said, you can't do that. You can't lead that show. It's too important. You can't lead that show. It's too important. And all the characters are in the military. They all have military rank. It's a black female actress. Star Trek. Star Trek. Star Trek. <laughs> Remember, do you ever think about why it's Captain Kirk, Captain Picard? They have the military protocol, right? It's the Navy in the future. 
Star Trek is a show about the military. They use military rank, military protocol, and Starfleet Academy is based on West Point even having the same rank insignia and honor code as West Point. But in the future, there's no war, poverty, or hunger on Earth. So the military's mission has changed from war to disaster relief, humanitarian aid, and exploration. And that's already happening to some extent in the world today. For example, the New Zealand Army is no longer focused on waging war. The New Zealand Army performs missions of peace, humanitarian aid, disaster relief, and it, and it protects wheels from poachers. And think of what the U.S. Army could do if its mission changed from war to disaster relief. The U.S. Army is the only organization in the world that can deploy tens of thousands of physically fit, mentally tough, well-trained people to any spot in the globe in a matter of days. Imagine U.S. soldiers being used for earthquake relief, tsunami relief, natural disaster relief, fighting famine, fighting hunger. Wouldn't that be a good way to win hearts and minds around the world? In 2009, U.S. military performed 154 humanitarian aid missions in 61 countries. So what's the problem? Why are people still angry at us? We're also killing people, right? The military right now is half Peace Corps, half killing machine. And people don't like it when you kill their people. Remember what that Marine colonel in Afghanistan said, you kill a thousand Taliban, two civilians, it's a law. So imagine if around the world the U.S. had this reputation. Imagine if around the world the U.S. had this reputation. A natural disaster happens, the Americans come, they help, they leave. Leaving part's important. <laughs> How would we feel if a foreign country put a military base in America? How would the Americans react? We would go berserk if someone tried to put a military base in our country, right? And if the purpose of the American military is to protect the American people, if that is its purpose, the best way to protect the American people is to help people around the world. And the military is already recognizing that. But it's still stuck in many ways in that 20th century mentality, and we have to keep moving into the 21st century. And with terrorism, you deal with it with law enforcement. Terrorism is a law enforcement problem. For example, Al-Qaeda is more like the Mafia than they are like the Soviet Union. They're a transnational criminal network. 15 of the 19 hijackers from Saudi Arabia they plan the attacks from Germany. You can plan a terrorist attack from Alabama, San Francisco, anywhere. You can't defeat terrorism by occupying a country. But how do we catch the Unabomber, who was a terrorist? How do we catch Timothy McVeigh? How do we catch Jeffrey Dahmer and John Wayne Gacy? How do we catch those Nazis who fled from Europe after World War II? It's a police action. The military is not trained to go after a criminal network. So. I met a guy from Pakistan after I gave a talk in Washington. I met a guy from Pakistan. He said, there's something I never understood until after I heard your talk. He said, the American people, he said, I always saw the American people as being the most wonderful, friendliest, most generous, optimistic people in the world. The Americans are so generous, so friendly, so kind, so optimistic, but their government is so terrible. He goes, I never understood this contradiction. How can the American people be so wonderful and generous and kind and optimistic? And how can their government support dictatorships and wage wars and overthrow democratic regimes? And he goes, I finally figured out the contradiction. He said, I finally figured out how the American people can be so wonderful and their politicians can be so terrible. He said, the American people don't know what their government's doing around the world. They don't know what their Ameri the politicians are doing, what they're really doing. Now, would soldiers like that if their mission changed from war to disaster relief? Would soldiers like that? I think 98% of them would. 2% might not. <laughs> but here's a quote from General MacArthur. If you ever wonder whether soldiers would like that kind of mission, remember this quote from General MacArthur. General MacArthur said, the soldier above all other people prays for peace, for he must suffer and bear the deepest wounds and scars of war. The soldier above all other people prays for peace, for he must suffer and bear the deepest wounds and scars of war. So this is a more effective security paradigm we're talking about here. More effective in terms of safety. And we can talk a lot more about this. It's a lot of nuance to it. But we have to offer solutions. We can't just tell people don't support war. We have to offer a new paradigm that makes the old paradigm look obsolete. We have to offer better alternatives to people for providing security, spreading freedom, spreading democracy. The last thing I learned that I'll talk about today to change my life is that war is not inevitable and that world peace is possible. General Omar Bradley, a West Point graduate and one of the last five-star generals, said, it is easy for us who are living
to honor the sacrifices of those who were dead. Because it helps us to relieve the guilt we should feel in their presence. Wars can be prevented just as surely as they're provoked. And therefore, we who fail to prevent wars share in guilt for the dead. So General Omar Bradley said, wars can be prevented just as surely as they're provoked. And therefore, we who fail to prevent wars share in guilt for the dead. There's so much we can do to prevent wars and make a difference. And look at what has happened because people did something and made a difference. 200 years ago in America, anyone who was not a white male landowner was oppressed. If you were African American, Asian, Hispanic, female, even if you were white but you did not own land, you were oppressed. 200 years ago in America, women couldn't vote their own property. But look at how far we've come because of the women's rights, civil rights, and workers' rights movements. I'm half Korean, a quarter white, and a quarter black, and I grew up in Alabama, and the fact that I'm here shows you how far our country has come. And if you look globally, look globally, 500 years ago, things such as democracy, the right to vote, freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom of the press, women's and civil rights, virtually did not exist anywhere on the planet. How many countries were democracies 500 years ago? Zero. How many countries were democracies 200 years ago? How many countries were democracies 200 years ago? Anybody want to guess? Keep in, the, keep in mind Napoleon was dictator in France. He had overthrown the democratic government in France. So America was the only democracy, right? Any other guesses? Remember, the Iroquois Confederation didn't have universal right to vote. So that wasn't a democracy. But America was the only democracy 200 years ago. We were an experiment. But America wasn't a democracy if you were African American. America wasn't a democracy if you were female. America wasn't a democracy if you were white, unless you own land. But now look all over the world. Democracy is all over the world. Europe, Canada, North America, South America, New Zealand, Australia, parts of Asia, parts of the Middle East even, parts of Africa, in less than 200 years. Dramatic change in a small amount of time. And so the world is far from perfect, but if we've come so far, why can't we keep going in a positive direction? We have a long way to go, but if we've come so far, why can't we keep moving in a positive direction? What's better, a world where 60% of the women can vote or a world where 30% of the women around the globe can vote? 60%, right? And if we can go from 30 to 60, why can't we go from 60 to 90? I'm not sure what the percentage is now, but I do know that a few hundred years ago, the percentage was virtually zero. And look how much has changed in a couple centuries. So if we've come this far, why can't we keep going in that positive direction? So to see how far we can go, we have to know how far we've come. So I gave this talk one time and somebody said, you're wasting your time because no matter how hard you try, you'll never convince everyone. I responded by saying, but I don't have to convince everyone. What percent of the American population actively participated in the civil rights movement? What percent of the American population actively participated in the civil rights movement? Less than 1%. Less than 1% actively participated. What percent of the American population actively participated in the women's rights movement? Less than 1% actively participated. Susan B. Anthony would give a talk about women's rights, and people would be screaming at her so loud she couldn't hear herself speak. And the people screaming at her were women. That was a very controversial issue. And that's why Henry David Thoreau said, there are 999 patrons of virtue for every virtuous person. In other words, for every 999 people who think something's a good idea, one person does something about it. That's a fact of history. That's why you can't trust opinion polls. 70% of people think this or think that. Opinion without action has no impact. You have to take action. And that 1% can change the whole consensus of the population. But that 1% has to be very effective. If we get 1% of Americans to struggle for peace, we won't automatically have world peace. We have to be very effective at what we do. Right? And you don't have to convince everybody. Was every single man in America convinced that women should have the right to vote? There are still men in America who don't think women should have the right to vote. Right? But if a man tries to prevent a woman from voting, he'll get arrested. It's against the law. Was every single man, was every single white person in America convinced that segregation should be gone? There are still people in America who think segregation should come back. But it has become law. Where if someone tries to bring back segregation, they get in trouble with the law. So you change the attitude and then it impacts the law. Now if someone tries to prevent women from voting or they try to bring back segregation, there is a law against it. 
So you have to change attitudes. And then eventually the law can also change as a result of that, after you've convinced enough people and won hearts and minds. So we have to be very effective, very effective. We have to have a very convincing message that resonates with the American people. And it's important not to dehumanize people in the Middle East, right? Very important. But I see many liberals and peace activists dehumanize conservatives. They're a bunch of morons. They're a bunch of idiots. They're a bunch of cavemen. People call the Tea Party teabaggers and teetards, right? Same kind of dehumanization in a different form toward conservatives. If you're a Christian, you're a moron. You see liberals and peace activists echo this all the time. And keep in mind that people in power control people by dividing people. They want liberals to see conservatives as the enemy. They want peace activists to see people in the military as the enemy. Oh, if you're in the military, you're uh, some sort of barbarian. Some of the most peaceful people I've ever met are in the military. Some of the most aggressive people I've ever met are in the peace movement. The world is complicated. It's a complicated world. You can't just stereotype. So people in power control people by dividing them. And what is the Tea Party and the people who sympathize with the Tea Party upset about? They're upset about the economy, declining wages, jobs, the Wall Street bank, uh, bailout. And Noam Chomsky says that the existence of the Tea Party is a real failure of liberals and peace activists to reach out to conservatives. They're too busy calling these people stupid to try to reach out to them. And if you want to talk to a conservative about peace, you can talk about the Declaration of Independence. All men are created equal. We all have a right to life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness. You can talk about Jesus. Blessed are the peacemakers. I mean, who is more peaceful than Jesus? You can talk about Eisenhower, who is a Republican president and a West Point graduate in general who talked about the military-industrial complex and compared military spending to crucifixion. You can talk about anti-war generals like Smedley Butler. You can talk about Martin Luther King Jr. All sorts of common ground. And if we can't make peace with our own country, how can we possibly make peace with other countries? So maybe we can unify around certain American ideals, right? Maybe we can unify around our traditional American ideals if we have an approach that tries to not just preach to the choir, but tries to persuade people who don't agree with us. And today it's even more important that we become part of that 1%. Today it's even more important that we become highly trained in the art of waging peace and that we become part of that 1%. Gandhi and Martin Luther King Jr. waged peace in order to create a better world, but today we have to wage peace in order to ensure the survival of our world. Gandhi and Martin Luther King Jr. waged peace in order to create a brighter future, but today if we don't wage peace, we won't have a future. These are survival issues we're dealing with now, right? The world wasn't going to end if civil rights or women's rights wasn't achieved. But these are survival issues we're dealing with now. Nuclear weapons, war, environmental destruction. So we're, it's really a race against time. So we have to be very effective. So it's up to us to solve these problems. Now more than ever, the world needs you to wage peace. And I hope that you will all become part of the 1%, not the 2%. Thank you.